I can't tell you how excited I am to be uh, the, the moderator of this distinguished panel. Uh, we have um, the, the, the luminaries of comedy right now, and uh, I'm so excited to be uh, talking with them. You've, I, I'm not going to introduce them individually, because, uh, except to say uh, uh, you've got in your program their, their bio, uh, and rather than recapitulate that, I'd like to just start in by by asking uh, uh, questions, and I, I'm going to take a point of personal privilege and ask the question that I'm most uh, eager to ask for personal reasons, and that's of uh, John and Scott. How did you two become partners? <laughs> We met working for this guy uh, named Dan Petrie Jr., <laughs> <laughs> who is a horrible boss. Uh, no, uh, we all, just so you guys don't know, I was Dan's assistant for many years, and Scott was his director of development. And yes, we all have red hair, and that is very weird in an office, <laughs> in an office of three to have 100% red hair. Uh, and uh, just without, just not to butter up to the moderator, but he was absolutely the nicest guy, and I have no horror stories at all, sadly. Of I take issue with that. He was definitely not the nicest guy. Yeah, you, I, I remember you used to call it a fraternity hazing ritual that I was, in, you know, I, uh, putting you through. Dan is the rare boss who catches you writing when you're supposed to be working for him and punches up your joke and makes it a lot better, as opposed to <laughs> fires you like you should have done countless times. So we were very grateful for your tutelage. We, we had the luxury of working for a boss who sort of allowed us to write in between the cracks when there was some downtime and really help us sort of with our writing. And then, uh, and, then, then we, and of like, course, my career was going into the toilet at that time, so <laughs> they had a lot of lot of downtime yeah, too. And, th and then when our when our first when it was actually our second script sold for a decent amount of money, we promptly left him, and then it was just a, <laughs> completely to Hollywood. in the lurch, you know. <laughs> How did the two of you meet, uh, uh, Karen and, and Kirsten? Well, we met. Um, I I was living here in Los Angeles. I was working at a small independent production company called Cinetel up there, conveniently located next to the Body Shop Strip Club because we were making those kinds of movies, you know. And um, I was reading scripts, and then Karen at the same time was, I'll let you tell your side of the story. I was writing scripts and I sent her a query letter saying... It was a really good query letter. That I would like you to read. Pithy. Powerful studio executive that I thought she was. I did not know she was in a cubicle across from a strip club. I thought she was <laughs> at an actual studio. And uh, she read it and she called me and we met for drinks the next time I came out for meetings and we started writing on cocktail napkins that night in a bar. After oh. like about seven margaritas, so we thought we were geniuses already. Oh God, we're so smart. How we had cool. sex, like we had literary sex on the cocktail napkins, basically. Not actual. Like that. Sex. Not actual. Not actual. Sex. Sex. No, not actual. Sex. Oh, I was gonna say Very that, attractive, that. though. You know what, you know what went through my mind? Before, you, just before I forget now. this, I do have to say that the only boy that ever broke my heart had red hair. So I'm really digging <laughs> being up here with you guys. Really, <laughs> really. But yeah. Carrot Top went on to be a fabulous stand-up in Vegas. <laughs> yeah. He left for Vegas and steroids, it was fucking now, strippers. Now, Jim, you and I are, uh, we work without partners. Uh, do you yes. prefer that or are you envious of people who have partners or how do you feel? Well, there's two sides to that, of course. One is that it gets very lonely uh, when you're writing on your own. Uh, that's the downside. The upside is uh, when I go to the bank and cash a check, I get the full amount. <laughs> so less ten percent. Well, yes. Yes. Um, no, it's it's definitely. Um, it's funny because I've always been kind of a people person. I used to do stand up back in the day, and uh, you know I like being out and and uh, I sometimes I need an audience as it were. So it's a little ironic to me that I've been doing this for 20 years and spent so much of that in a room by myself trying to make myself laugh. That's a little daunting. So I think, and not daunting, but again ironic. But uh, you, you know uh, I think if if 
anybody in here is uh, going to hopefully embark on a 20-year writing career, you might factor in that whole hermetic thing <laughs> because, you know, you're home and uh, it, 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 it's just you and your thoughts and eventually that I can turn you into uh, Jack Nicholson in The Shining. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, there is a certain satisfaction when you're done and there's uh, that you've done it yourself. But honestly, uh, I don't have a great preference. I don't go out of my way to write alone. I've written a couple things with a guy I went to high school and film school with, a guy named Ryan Rowe, mm -hmm. um, who's been doing it as long as I have. We, we actually wrote something called Tape Heads uh, oh, yeah. when I was still uh, a senior in uh, film school at UCLA. Um, I own that movie on VHS. Awesome. <laughs> Um, they came out in DVD, actually. If you, yeah, I can hook you up. Okay, I can update it. <laughs> um, and I think it actually says in my little pink bio that I wrote tape as and got paid three thousand bucks or something. Um, but we just, we never thought we would get that made. Of course, it was just kind of like uh, Richard Walter. If anybody knows UCLA, he's a big screenwriting professor. He, I think, he actually fielded a call, a cold call, and occasionally people would call the film school and go, "I'm trying to write a comedy. I have no money. Do you have anybody that's kind of funny?" And that's, so that's how that came about. Um, and, uh, and since then, of course, Richard Walters sent me a, any number of letters saying, hey, Alumni Association. Yes, yes. Where's this? Stay up. Yes, which, you know, you have to, you have to uh, respect that. And uh, so I'll be sending him a check anytime now. Great, great. Uh, but uh, remember, uh, the, for your less leftover money, the Writers Guild Foundation course. is a uh, tax-deductible contributions. <laughs> uh, and all of your contributions are gratefully uh, received. Uh, was, that, was that your first tape heads? Or what was your, what was your spec sale that kind of put you on, on the map? You know, um, I went from uh, writing tape heads and that just kind of went off and we didn't know what was going to happen to that. And then I got uh, um, my friend Ed Solomon, who uh, again, um, went to UCLA with Ed. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Ed, he's, he's had some big credits. His most notable ones are uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, which he co-wrote with Chris Matheson. And that actually, when I was at UCLA, a group of us, including Shane Black and um, Chris and Ed and Ryan Rowe and um, uh, a guy named Fred Decker who wrote with Shane and directed a movie called Monster Squad, which is at a bit of a comeback, uh, I think, on DVD. Anyway, we all did something called the UCLA Comedy Club, which was a stand-up comedy group. And we would perform on campus in the dorms and there at Kirkhoff Coffee House. And in, and, in that, and, in, in, and in doing that, we would have a show a month and we would have to come up with five minutes of original material. And this was, this was kind of when stand-up was just becoming, it was kind of the golden age of stand-up, if you will. This is the early 80s. And so we used to hang out. We used to get, a, you know, a local headliner at the time, a guy who was an up-and-comer playing the comedy store or playing the improv. So we got guys like Seinfeld and Leno and Gary Shandling to come and hang out with us and do, they would be the headliner and he would, you know, students would do approximately, you know, there'd be 10 students, we'd do five minutes, so we'd do maybe a little over an hour, and then the guy would come up and do, and Mike Binder did a lot too, Mike Binder. Um, and um, uh, they would do, whatever, 45 minutes, and that was a free show. And then from that, we all just got into, we got the, we got the bug, you know. We learned how to write comedy, and because we had to come up with five new minutes all the time, we were constantly... Uh, uh, writing, and um, and it was really and so you couple that with going to film school. So by day I'm studying film and film structure. By night I'm writing comedy and hanging out with people like Shandling. So and and I'm still not even I still don't even know at that point what I'm going to do with my life. Now it's obvious, but I was still like God. What am I going to do when I get out of college? God, you know I had no idea. Just didn't think it was necessarily a realistic option to go and be a comedy writer because I wasn't raised that way. Nobody in my family yeah, had ever been. In involved in show business. So it was always just kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, like looking back, it all makes sense. But at the time, I, I had no idea. Anyway, Shandling got to know a bunch of us. And when Shandling got his, uh, his first show, which was called his Gary Shandling Show, and was on Showtime, and then it moved to Fox. Mm -hmm. And then years later, of course, he came up with Larry Sanders. But um, he hired uh, uh, Ed and, and, and myself to be on the writing staff. So that was my first real job. That was a small screen job. And in fact, I wasn't in the guild yet, so they gave me a uh, researcher credit. 
So, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, if you look at some of the uh, really, really old channelings, you'll see my name scroll behind a researcher, researching jokes. Jokes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, that, but to answer your question, my first spec was something that I wrote um, called uh, uh, The Deedles Down on the Farm, and it was about two surfers who go to Kansas uh, as punishment and wind up saving their their uncle's uh, Kansas farm from uh, from a bad guy. And National Lampoon uh, optioned it, and we're actually scouting locations and going into pre-production on it. When when uh, it turned out that the guy who was running Lampoon Films at the time was like Hollywood's version of Bernie Madoff, I think. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he seemed to have all this money, and then all of a sudden he was on the lamb, and Interpol was looking for him, and I don't know. <laughs> but um, but to, th that's the script that got me a ton of meetings, and it was very edgy at the time. There was actually a scene in it where, um, and this is like 1980. Seven, I think, uh, where one of the guys loses his. They're supposed to learn. They're surfers, and they're supposed to learn all these things to to win the prize money at a county fair. So one of the things was like they have to learn how to milk cows really quick. And so the guy with the glasses loses, gets kicked by a cow. His glasses fall off. He turns around. The cow walks away. A bull walks in. He grabs the bucket and starts yanking. So now that's tame. But at the time in '87, it's like, oh my God, there's he's jerking off a bull. You know. So, you know, there's been a lot of semen comedy since then. But at the time, it was very cutting edge and Lampoon was like reading that and going, oh my God, this is, you know, we, we got to buy this. So so you've really enriched all our lives. I really have. I'm the, <laughs> I think it was a seminal comedy, you could say. Uh, yes. Seminal yeah. moment in comedy. But um, but that that's the very long-winded answer to your questions. My first spec was the Deedles Down on the Farm, which if anybody has kids who are about 20 now, they may have, they may have dragged you when they were about 10 to a piece of crap made by Disney called Meet the Deedles which I wrote, and Paul Walker was in it, um, and it, it just got turned into this this, this very soft uh, Disney movie. And I got sole writing credit, and I was happy to take the money, but it was nothing like what I originally envisioned. No, no the bull scene, I'm guessing, was out. Yeah, they're not, they, they, yeah, wasn't wasn't quite ready for the, ca there was a castle film, which starts with a da na 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 and the castle shows up, yes. and then a bull ejaculates. That wouldn't. Yes, <laughs> yes. That probably wouldn't work. Doesn't happen. No, no. No. Mommy, what just happened? No. Uh, uh, Karen and Kirsten, what uh, what was your first uh, spec together that uh, or first, first sale or uh, sale or or thing that thing that the very thing that, first time the very the thing that put you on the map. Oh well, that was ten things I hate about you. Oh. Ten things I hate about you. Mm -hmm. It was our first sale. We did, but we did write another script prior to that. It was uh, the script that started on the cocktail napkins was a kind of a female action movie about girls who kill Navy SEALs with their bare hands. They're really mad. And we thought they were badass and we had a great time writing it. And then we showed it to people like with penises and they were scared and they didn't want to yeah. represent us. Yeah. <laughs> so um, then we wrote, then we, but we loved writing together. We wrote long distance around that time. We, so we wanted to write a teen movie and, um, Clueless had come out, and so we were very inspired by the notion of teen movie that's an update of a classic, so we kind of set out scouring the the um, the annals of literature for a, a you know a great a great classic story, and we found Taming of the Shrew, and so that became our foundation and um, then this the script took quite a while to sell i mean we took us a while to find our our representation our and then once we found our manager he sold it in like three weeks but, but we had like some producers had. attached and mm -hmm. we kind of had this like circuitous thing i think we went out with it as a script with them attached and it didn't sell and then it kind of had a second life and um and then we too got staffed on a television show as um as part of we got a blind television deal when the script sold and mm -hmm. it enabled Karen to escape from Denver. Yes, and moved right. to Los Angeles. So we actually got to be in the same place together. But that was a great instruction and tutelage for us working on that show because we were young writers. We we were very naive about, you know, pitching and kind of selling the joke. And, um, and then we were thrust into a room with like a dozen really accomplished comedy writers. and. Who almost 
went to Ivy League schools, oddly enough. I felt very insecure in that room. Yeah. I yeah. went to a party school in the South. Yeah, who was the showrunner <laughs> of that? Uh, Jeff Greenstein, who had a perfect SAT score. What the wow. fuck? <laughs> Right. That's and he was he was partnered with a fellow named Jeff Strauss at that time. Right. That was the last uh, show they did together. Um, they broke up and midway then, through the show. Yeah, that show because it I was called that. Getting Personal, starring Vivica A. Fox. It was the lowest rated network John comedy Cryer. of the year. <laughs> <laughs> and yet we stayed on the air for like a year and a half. God. Now we they pull like, like, something after two. Her. But yeah, 22 episodes of the lowest rated network. I was uh, on staff for a show that was the very first one canceled in the season, as well. What was it called? <laughs> it was called The Trouble with Larry. It was a f it was Bronson Pinchot's follow up to Perfect Strangers. Oh. And um, and it was it was run by and guess who was on the staff with me? This hack named Charlie Kaufman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we were we were fucking miserable. It was uh, run by the guys that used to be Carson's head writers. And when Carson quit to let Leno take over, they got all sorts of deals. And um, they were, you know, they were not that great with running a show. They'd never done it before, so they really really put the staff through a lot of crap. Um, but anyway. It was like, I felt like uh, it was like the middle of, we, oh, plus Fox rolled us out early. Fox had this scheme of, hey, you know what? We're going to, most shows premiere in September. We're going to premiere in August. Get them hooked early. <laughs> so by like September 1, I was out of work. <laughs> it's like being, it's like getting beamed in on the DL in preseason baseball. You're just already out for the season. It's terrifying. Anyway. Now, uh, John and Scott, what was the first uh, thing that really put the two of you on the radar in, in the town? This is so weird because I know you know the answer to that. <laughs> uh, we wrote a script called Flypaper that got us an agent, and which I'm happy to say is looking like it may, 10 years later, be getting made. <gasps> so uh, if fun. there's any... We have uh, hope for our Navy yeah. SEALs. No, movie. honestly. Right. We sure like, do. We're like, the, we're going to show our trailer in front of the Navy SEAL, the girls <laughs> who kill Navy SEALs because they're angry movies. Yours might be a Lifetime movie, actually. Okay. It appeals to no, women. We, we thought yeah. about that. That's a good idea. Actually, we'll talk the, later. The germ of that idea, I have to tell you, did come from comedy because me and a bunch of friends were drunk in a hotel room and my sister had picked up a Navy SEAL and he was passed out on our bed and we were like this is a trained killer and we could fucking take him out right now <laughs> like, he is at our mercy yeah. so I think we just need to revamp it a little bit you know do that right. version yeah there's hope it could be kind of a weekend right. at Bernie's maybe he's really dead I don't know you don't know until you, the, could, okay. you could club Guys, him you could club him paper, and people would be paper. upset that you're clubbing seals <laughs> thank you good night I, uh, I, I tell you uh. that that uh, um, I, if I had a checkbook, I'd buy it <laughs> right now. That's so hot. What, um, wait, what, I have a question. What's Flypaper about? It's, uh, it's, uh, like a bank heist movie. These two bank robberies go down at the same time and everybody gets trapped in the bank and then people start dying one at a time. And Ooh. so, and it's a comedy, but, and, and it's hilarious the way they die. Um, so it's sort of like a, I don't know, crime heist comedy. And so, that's, but those are kind of hard to write. Honestly, it's amazing. You guys should read it. <laughs> I know, I want to. Wow. But it is. I, I think actually, John and I have come back around to trying to write more specs and generate original material because we've, uh, like, we started writing about ten years ago and didn't have. I mean, we made a living at it, but didn't have a ton of success until really like the past year where we had a couple movies got made um, and so through that time of doing assignments it was always nice to have flypaper because it was a script that we owned and occasionally somebody option it for like a dollar and then it's like oh it's gonna get made and then it doesn't and then but you always sort of had it you always had this thing that it's might great to always made. have that hope yeah, no, seriously. It's always nice. So you, it's always every, nice to have that run, so Even when you're established writers like us, there's always you're running on some hope at some point, and it's always great to have that. And so it's always good to generate your own material because you have something that you own and and could sell it sort of any any time. It might just sort of come come out and get made. Um, now, was Hangover an assignment then? No, hang, Hangover actually sort of came from the same thing, where or, or at least that same instinct that we had. Uh, we had pitched it to a studio, and nobody wanted to buy a bachelor party movie. Um, and we had sort of developed it so much that we liked it. We're like, let's just write it, because then we'll have another script. You know, even if nobody buys it, everybody hates bachelor party movies. We'll always have that script to maybe set up, and somebody bought it and made it. Yeah. Was it like a go. bidding war, or? It was a good couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, yeah. You don't want to answer that question? No, no I mean, I think, curious. yeah, we basically got it to Todd Phillips. And once he comes aboard, as you guys probably know, once a big A-list director comes on your movie, then suddenly it's, and he says, it's, it'll be my next movie, then it sort of becomes a lot more serious as opposed to just the 
we love these writers that uh, you know that doesn't usually trigger the sale so we got lucky by getting Todd aboard early and then once he came aboard it was this you know those are the phone calls you wake up you know you're, you're very excited to get from your agent where he starts throwing out numbers that like your dad has never made in his entire life and you're like yeah that's fine he's like we're going for more you're like okay that's great <laughs> yeah. um, and like literally your agent stops calling you because he knows that Scott and I are such cowards that we're like that's fine that's fine Cut, just take it take it take it take it take it <laughs> and invariably he's like dude I know like they get they get the eye of the tiger like agents like <laughs> love this stuff this is like the oxygen they breathe and so when they have the spec that they can like grind down all the people that have been grinding them, it's like, <laughs> it's scary. It's like a terrifying thing. Uh, I should mention that uh, last weekend, uh, The Hangover uh, passed uh, Beverly Hills Cop to become the most successful R-rated comedy of all time. Uh, Do it, if you actually inflate it, inflate, you know, with, with uh, inflation adjustment, I think Beverly Hills Cop is still Dan's way Dan's movie way still ahead. has yeah. double R. But, uh, you know, The Ugly Truth is coming along, and it opened huge, so it may pass. Despite the wretched, wretched reviews. Well, you know, I First tell you, that. reviews for comedy... Um, Reviews for The Hangover were really good, yeah, though. You guys got well, good reviews. Honestly, it's a, it's a film it's classic. Make it a competition I mean, com or anything. You know. <laughs> you know. Um, I mean, you had guys fucking chickens. If we'd had that. <laughs> uh, people, you need to write, I think most critics are men, frankly. And I think a guy, a movie that makes like 40-year-old, angry, cynical critics happy for two hours, they're like, this is genius. It's just like Lubitsch or whatever. <laughs> and, and, and movie, you know what I mean? It's just that simple. I don't think there's a... Yeah. yeah I, we're just writing dude movies from now on. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> and we're moving on your turn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and I should I should mention that um, uh, between Meet the Parents and Meet the Folkers, uh, uh, they they uh, uh, they made their they weren't R rated movies and so they made considerably more than uh, either of our or we're like still the Falkers are still the uh, highest grossing non-animated comedy in history. Yes. Uh, yeah. Very so. cool. Handy factoid. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I think it's 280 it domestic. R. You had like the tip of a penis going into some soup, right? No, but it was not attached to a man. <laughs> it was a baby penis. As long as it's a baby penis? Yes, you sure. can do foreskin, I think. It's in the <laughs> thing you just can't do. So no. You can't do the fully yeah. attached anteater. See, thing. this is this is uh, <laughs> this is all different, you know. This brave new world of comedy. Listen, um, when you when you approach a screenplay, whether it's on whether it's as a, um, a pitch or or as an assignment, um, what's what's the first thing that you think of? Is it concept? Is it, is it story? Is it uh, uh, the the, the due uh, date? The the due yeah. <laughs> I would uh, say premise. The the premise. To elaborate on that, if you would. Well, if I can. If we can see the three acts and know where the story's going and see it as a movie, as soon as someone tells us the premise, then we're interested. But if, I mean, lately we've been getting a lot of producers calling with, you know, weird premise free yeah, movies. Yeah, like little, not, not even a corn kernel of an idea. Areas, <laughs> regions. Like, we would yeah. like an ensemble comedy where everyone ends up at a concert. Go! And we're like, <laughs> First act yeah. break. Come on. It's like it's mothers. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I got three guys, versus. nothing in common, yeah. a locked room. I, yeah. I I had a pitch to me that that uh, said, Dan, you started in an agency mailroom, didn't you? I said yes. He said, agency mailroom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and. Well, you're the writer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, just come up with a caper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah caper. I think on the on the concept note, I think the worst thing Scott and I we always talk about the worst thing you can hear walking into a meeting is like I got a hundred great ideas, because invariably you're like you have no good ideas. Yeah. I can just tell you right now. Yeah. Like we, like for Scott and I, and maybe you guys are. I, I hope I hope your process is way like faster and easier. But for us, it's like one good idea a year is like great. 
like a really good idea. Not that, that we we have thousands of B plus ideas that we could. If you got Seth Rogen, you know what I mean. It's great, but if you don't get a start, like the truly the truly great concept is the one where you don't even need anything attached. It's just it's sort of like an unarguable idea. And those are so hard for us to come by. Maybe for other people they're easier, but. Uh, I don't know. I Hangover was a great idea, though. I, I really, I really agree. I agree. I mean, sit you around know. all day, like, say, how do we do the hangover? What's, how do we get that like uh, premise? It's I'm such, a little, such a little premise. worried about the sequel. I will say, just because it's not, you know, you're just, you're gonna, the, people like the characters, of course. They forget again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like, it's like Gilligan and the Coconut. Boop. Oh, amnesia. You know, but on the other hand, the studios would rather make Hangover 2 than have the risk of making Hangover 1. So yeah. that's a built-in thing. Uh, does, does a concept, do you feel, need to be pitchable? Or if you're writing something on spec, can it be, can it be more amorphous can it, than that? Uh, sure. It's sort of sad, but I actually think at the end of the day, it, it really helps it that it's pitchable and for a couple of reasons that when when they read the spec or even when you pitch it to when you're getting hired usually who you're pitching to needs to then go to their boss and say here's the idea and be able to explain it in a couple lines so their boss gets it and says okay yes buy that but even more on a basic level the the studio is buying it because they need to believe that they can then sell it to the audience. There's so many movies coming out every year that they need to believe that, okay, in on the side of a bus or in like a 30 second TV spot, I can get this idea across and people are gonna wanna go see this. So if you're, if you're making commercial studio movies, it actually does really help to be able to pitch it in a really clean fashion. If you're making uh, quality films, like independent films that are actually uh, uh, interesting and and don't have to be sort of like boiled down to a very clean pitch. Then then I don't think it matters. I, I think you can write like just like a crazy spec that that would take somebody three hours to explain. Um, but I think if you're trying to get like a studio job, it really helps for it to be a clean idea. Yeah, like if you can't explain it, then how are they supposed to? Yeah. And it helps when you're writing, obviously, if you can distill it down, because it, it, those those times, especially in Act Two, where you know the, the second act's always the trickiest, or if you ca if you've got a vision in your head of of what this thing is in in a, in a sentence or two, and you can almost visualize the marketing in the one sheet, then that's kind of almost like your theme in a way. It always helps when you're writing to go, well, okay, I'm a, it's a meandering a little bit. What's my theme again? What am I trying to say? What is this movie in a you know in a in, in a nutshell? And if you've got that in your head, then that's kind of your touchstone for writing, I think, through the through the kind of the, the trickier parts of the process. You know, uh, to follow up on process questions, uh, each one of you has referred to the, the three act structure in one way or another. Uh, is that fair to say that you all look at that and and that informs your work? Um, do you outline, yes. Jim? I don't outline enough. <laughs> um. I, I do. I, what I typically do is because I know the benefit of outlining, and I know I know how uh, it's it's great to just kind of do st the, the stream of consciousness where I'm just banging away at whatever's coming through, and I'll worry about how to make it, you know, in, put it in script form and finesse it later. Um, but after doing that for maybe a, a couple of weeks, I start to get itchy, and, and I've done. We were talking about this in the room before we came out. I've done so many. Uh, I've done, you know. 15 years of assignments. I haven't specced anything in a really long time, so I've always had a deadline. And, it, and no matter what, it always starts slow. And then, uh, and then there's, I, I start to get a little bit of a head of steam, but by then they want it in like three weeks. So typically, you know, I write the last, you know, 30, 40 pages in about three weeks. Um, and, you know, even though they've given me maybe three months to write it. Um, so I do outline, but again, at some point it reaches this critical mass where I go, okay, I, th I think I have enough of the road map. I'm, I'm freaking out a little bit. I wish I had the discipline to, to outline it all the way through. I just don't, I don't have it. I worked with Nancy Myers on something for a, for a while, and she is meticulous. She outlines and outlines and outlines, and, 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 in front, and I know Ted and Terry, uh, Rossio and Elliot, who are obviously wildly successful, and they apparently uh, 
they're they're like ninety percent outline, ten percent script. Or like they get it down so that they bang through a, they can write a whole script, uh, you know, in in weeks because they've outlined it for you know on and off for months. Sure. But I don't have the I don't I don't know what it is. I just at some point I just and part of it is that because my background is writing jokes and um, uh, that I just get. I, you know, I don't, I want to get into it. I want to write things that make me laugh. I want to actually start doing the dialogue. So I start to get bored with the process if I outline for too long. Yeah. I think that's yeah. why so many um, comedies have the endings reshot. Is because it's like the least <laughs> thought about part of the whole development that's process. Like, We're probably. almost done. Turn it in. Yay. Yeah. You do definitely smell the barn and the quality does drop sometimes. Sure. Yes. But if you, if you, you over outline, you just, you get bored with it. I mean, yeah. one project we worked on recently, I felt, I kept saying like, I feel like we already wrote this script and now I don't want to write it anymore. Cause I've it's very true. It. It's very true. And so we kind of have to leave something fresh for ourselves to write. Sure. Yeah. I yeah. actually, I actually had a, uh, a friend over recently who was in my office doing some stuff on his computer, and he listened to Scott and I. Scott didn't know this for like three hours, working, banging out an outline. And he, would, he, at the end of the day, he was like, "That was so unfunny." And I was like, "I know, making comedies is not funny. It's like most of what we do just sounds like grinding out a drama. And then the jokes, you know, the jokes are. We'll laugh every now and again if there's something that you know really merits it. And if we, we actually both laugh, then we definitely write it down. But to us, like the jokes are the last five percent of the movie. And so much of the torture is like the story, the story, the story, the characters, the characters, getting the arcs all lined up, all that, all the math of it. Um, yeah." Is that true of you? Uh, you it's slightly different for you. You think about. I was the just thinking that there, that what he just described is the opposite of what I do. I was thinking oh. like we should just get a three of us because, because um, what I tend to do is um, uh, you never and everybody who's going to write comedy in this room don't write this down. This is a good note. Don't ever chase jokes. Don't come up with a great joke and then have your story go off and meander and chase Aaron. to work that joke in. I always <laughs> cut our because you have because because ultimately it'll get cut but I'm, I've been but guilty of that at times where I go oh no no I got to get this joke in there and you're you know you're you're you're, tr you're tracking well and you're kind of lined up and then you go yeah let's go out I'm gonna go out over here and get that joke and then come back in sometimes you can do that if you have the right movie I mean um, you know the thing that just popped in my head was uh, maybe it was Ace Ventura Pet Detective, the second one or something, and I was actually uh, working with Jim Carrey on some things, and I talked to him about that. I go, yeah, I can't believe you and Shadyac went so out in the, you know, off off story just to get that sequence where he's birthed by a robotic rhino. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you remember that or not. And he, and, 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 and I'm going to really name drop here. Spielberg was in the room when I was talking to Carrey because he was, they were going to, Spielberg was going to direct me to parents, and Carrie was going to star in it at one point. And Spielberg like cut me off and went, "That was the funniest scene! Like, how dare I like try to?" And I was like, "No, I was just saying it was an interesting process, Stephen." Ah. But um, but you don't want to do that, really. You don't want to uh, uh, do that, and I'm guilty of it a lot of times, because I still uh, uh, forget occasionally. Because I'm so, this is part of working alone, by the way. I'm so desperate to make myself laugh that I'm hanging on to that joke and. Making it work, but uh, but sometimes when I write with a partner, then it's it's like you know it's it's a little easier to stay on track, and it's I don't I, you know. A lot of times during our outlining process, like we'll start to. Um, like r sort of redevelop it a little bit like we had a pitch we were working on yesterday and Karen always has this like kind of stricken look on her face like but we can't do that because it changes that line in the in the in the middle the one like, that we like it totally fucks up the second act what but are you talking about we can't about? do that and then like we'll and we're like but we haven't even written it yet like, oh yeah it fucks up the second act and I'm like that's what I said 20 minutes ago not always is that the case but <laughs> it's always in my head perfectly <laughs> but the reality is you're all very talented and funny so what, and what I found you know when you kill your darlings is that you know eventually you'll come up with another couple of good jokes and they'll be on story and they'll be more character based and they'll work better usually so yeah sometimes she says sometimes not all the time though I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, th I think for John and I, some of it is a little bit, uh, it's just practical, because we, you were telling a story that you got your first job and you guys could both sort of be in the same town and working together. When we started making money, we started working apart. Like, we don't like to be in the same room at all. We can't stand each other. And so, um, so writing the outline gives us something that we can at least be following. So it's like we spend time together cranking out the outline, and then you can write in different locations, and at least you have a roadmap to work on together. And when he strays, he gets in trouble. 
Yeah. <laughs> that was a piece race. Do you, do you uh, uh, transmit, do you, you say, I'll take this scene, you take that scene, we'll send them to each other. Is that how it works? or uh, I, Ideally, for John and I, we, we beat out the outline, and then uh, one of us will go off and write the first draft. Usually John does the, the first whole draft, and then he'll email it to me, and then I'll rewrite it, and we send it back and forth that way. If we're, if we're like close to production and they need something right away, then we'll break up the script into scenes. Wow. Cool. Is that how you guys work, no, or you work differently? You work room. in the same room. We started, though, you know, because of our different locations, we would get together, outline, then break up chunks, you know, like, say, a sequence of, like, yeah. five to ten scenes, and we divvy up the whole script that way, and then we put it all together. But then we, and we did that for probably, like, I don't know, eight years or something, but we found that there was lots of contention because um, we would, are you rewriting my number? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been 13 years. Which was when? Six years ago. Use the mic. What do you what? Do you know the answer to that? I don't even know. I want you to use the mic. Oh, sorry. Now we stopped doing that on She's the Man. So whenever. Yeah, whenever, whenever that was. I don't know. Um, but we would have lots of contention because we were rewriting each other's scenes, and then it was like we were too personally invested in our own work and defending what was on the page, and so we had this job where we had to sort of rewrite a script, and we we did it all in the same room, and it was we were kind of mutually invested, and so then we also had along the way we'd get notes from people, and then we were kind of, you know, united in our rewriting process, and we just figured that was better because we had kind of more of a collective thing happening as opposed to separate, I wrote that, she wrote that. So at this point, it's hard for us to remember who wrote what because we're sitting in the room pitching sure. it out loud to each other, the whole script. And it's Jim, I hear you way. alternate with your evil twin to, uh -huh. to uh, send scenes back and forth. You know, you have to be careful, actually, because when you write alone, um, you know, uh, you, you want to try to find your creative period, too, during the day. Because there are times, I, I, mine's typically at night, and when I, and that was great until I had kids. <laughs> so I had to start working in the day more. But the, the reason I'm bringing this up is that I'll look at something at one, some point, and I'll, and I'll laugh, and I'll go, this is gold. And then the next day I'll look at it and go, what the fuck, and just start rewriting it. <laughs> so, you know, because there's no partner there going, no, no, it's fine. Trust me, leave it. So you have to, you, you, ha you definitely have to be, you know, more aware of your, your instincts and 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 when something's good, uh, you know I don't know. Put a post-it note on it if you have a if you printed it out and go don't touch this. It'd be like be like memento or something. Uh, you know you liked this yesterday, idiot. Because <laughs> yeah. you just you know I mean it's just a personality thing. And then a lot of comics are like that. When I worked on Chandling, if you had a great joke, uh, we used to shoot on Fridays. If you had a great joke on Tuesday, you didn't pitch it to Gary till Thursday, because if you pitch it to Gary on Tuesday, and he goes, that's hilarious. By Thursday, he's bored with it, and you're chucking it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, and it happens. It's kind of, that's some, sometimes that's the way it is for me, too. If I wrote something too early on, and then I read it over and over again, I go, I'm not laughing at that. It's no shit, I'm not laughing at it. It's comedy is surprise. Comedy is you know, shock. It's like, oh, I didn't see that coming. Ha ha. But, you know, you have to, yeah. that's something that you have to be very aware of when you write comedy is, is you know, uh, your own kind of personal, uh, you know, your personality, I guess, is, you know, are you somebody who's, uh, who, who doesn't, uh, uh, you know, trust your instincts enough? And, uh, you know, I'm learning, I'm still learning to do that more. I'm not, obviously don't have it down. So. I guess yeah. we're lucky that way, because jokes that are in our first draft make it onto the screen. We don't. Every single one. Not every single one. <laughs> <laughs> but we still think our shit's funny 20 drafts later. Maybe it was because well, we drink so I think guess it's the same. We, we think they're hilarious throughout time, throughout eternity. <laughs> the problem is what you're saying to me is almost like what I'm hearing is like this just reminds me of why it's so hard to develop comedy and why Scott and I have gone more and more towards writing originals is because it's like the development process for comedy. Like four years, the studio people are reading the same jokes over and over and the script that like killed... It, like even within three reads later, it's like we just have some questions, and you're like, oh, <laughs> and then you know they're all dead. So it's like it's hard to find that. Like, I mean, I think like you said, like it's surprise, but it's also just making it quickly is the same. It's the writing process mirrors the d production process in that way. Like the faster you can get it kind of up and running, I think the f the funnier your movie can be. Yeah, and and. Uh, 
and we were again I and I don't think I'm repeating myself too much here but when we were in the green room before we started I was just telling Dan how I, I need to spec more um, be, because you know because mostly because you retain the ownership of it and you know I've uh, I haven't had a movie since Fockers um, although I was very pregnant with Toy Story 3 we were already in production uh, six months into production 25 million dollars and then the Pixar merger came and what I didn't what I did not know at the time when I took the gig was that we were the, the, that Disney team making Toy Story 3 was literally a uh, a pawn in a pissing match with Mike Eisner and Steve Jobs, and I think we know who pissed better in that case. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, a point being, uh, uh, yes, I've been earning a living, but it's not about earning a living at some point. It's about getting your work out there and getting something made. So I'm now I'm specking something. I'm also developing stuff in television at this point, but I'm specking something because I'm so tired of having people go, great job, you know, let's put it on this shelf. <laughs> <laughs> we love it so much. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, so I just, you know, I still have scripts out there that people think very highly of, but nothing's happening with them because I don't have any control over them. So the, the lesson here is even if you are doing well and can take assignments, st you should still try to keep that spec going, even if you only pick it up every couple of days or whatever and write a couple of pages or make some, anything, you know, uh, just to keep that going. So you've got something at some point that if you run into development, in hell over and over again, you can finally, you know, at least have some control and say, yeah, you know, you, you want to buy this? Great. You, you got six months to make it, and if you don't make it or attach this talent or whatever, then it's coming back to me and I'm going to do something else with it because, you know, it's otherwise, uh, again, you can earn a living, but it's not, that's not what anybody's in this for. They're in this, they're in this to, to see their work on the screen and to, you know, entertain and make people laugh, so. What trends do you see in comedy, or is that something you pay in, uh, attention to? Uh, I would like to see the rated R be a trend, and I think it is right now, but then there's like this brain fart in the studio system where like a rated R movie will make a shitload of money, and then two months later they'll be like, oh, you have to make this PG-13, because that's the only way you're going to make money. And you're just like, wait a minute, Sex in the City just opened to $57 million. And they're like, oh, no, 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 women's rated R movies don't make any money. Like, they just forget. Mm -hmm. And it's so frustrating to try to reconvince them and re-remind them. And, and like with uh, teen movies, we kept wanting to make rated R teen movies, and they're like, no, no, kids can only go see PG-13 movies. And then we're like, well, why did American Pie 1, 2, and 3 make a bazillion fucking dollars? Like, they just... Super bad bizarre, too, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's yeah. if there's I, a female protagonist, they don't... I, I think that the, that's a terrifying thing to a studio, is like a young woman who's sort of a little bit, like, racy and sexually advanced, because I, I don't think they want to imagine their daughters are Like, that if way. Amanda Bynes drops the F-bomb, like... <laughs> <laughs> they just want to like cry when they think about that at studio levels, but it's silly. <laughs> I, I don't I don't know that I see any trends. I think it's surely the studio executives are looking for trends and they're probably buying things based upon what they think is going to be successful. I think our theory is is any comedy is going to make a ton of money if the trailer's funny. If people see that and they laugh a couple times during the trailer, people are going to go, you know. And it's like R-rated comedies weren't doing well, and then I don't know, Forty Year Old Virgin and Knocked Up. It's like these guys who nobody had seen the actors in it, but the trailers were funny. People just started going, you know. Borat. It's like a mockumentary comedy about whatever it's like the trailer was funny it's a funny movie and I think like at the end of the day that's I think it makes more sense to focus on writing really funny movies rather than oh this is they're looking for you know PG-13 teen comedies with squirrels or whatever it is like that you know one, one, one thing that's becoming a I bit of a trend this. <laughs> just to build on to build on that is that there's been some high profile star vehicle failures in the last couple months so so for from a writing standpoint it's a little encouraging knowing that the studios now they come out and they go well you know just to use this as an example even though I, I like Will Ferrell you know Land of the Lost came out and tanked terribly and so they're saying you know what we're realizing is that it's less about the star and more about the story and the concept so I remember reading that and then probably 
LA Times interview and thinking, oh good, they're recognizing the value of good writing and a good story as opposed to just this, you know, A-list, $20 million a picture star has decided to do his own little thing and we're supposed to just find it funny. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, in the, whether that's just a trend until the next big Will Ferrell movie, I don't know. But it, that was kind of encouraging from a creative standpoint to, 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 to hear the, the uh, studios agreeing that it's, it's more about uh, the writing and, and, the, and the concept than, than the elements that it used to be. Yeah, I think with in the wake of the Hangover, we obviously it's like the meetings we have are all like, "Great, we love Hangover. What's what's the next Hangover? Can you give us another Hangover? We liked Hangover. Can you have Hangover again?" And I think, I think yeah. that the, it's it's funny because well, Scott and I have a few ideas in that arena because we're you know we we, we we're hung over a lot. Yeah, we will cannibalize ourselves, our own work, but it's like it's like great. We want unknowns, and it's kind of like uh, you know fun, high concept idea, uh, maybe even mystery driven or plot driven, um, and we're like no stars, keep the budget low, so everyone makes lots and lots of money. It's great, and then it's like great. We love this idea. Let's get Will Smith, and you're like, all right. <laughs> I don't know how to tell you this. He's like the biggest dude in the world. Like let's like the lessons are sort of learned. I think they're always sort of half learned, if that makes any sense. Like it's like, oh we want to make it small and we'll keep it we'll keep it all you know, we'll find other ways to cut the budget. But ultimately the studios it's so much safer to protect your job by by hiring big A list movie stars and having them fail than having your movie fail that doesn't have any stars. Yeah. That's, that seems to be our observation. By the way, isn't it also true that by the, by the time you can recognize a trend, it's too late? <laughs> so, and also on on the, sort of on that note, like I think one of the reasons The Hangover has enjoyed like some of its success is that you don't know these guys, so they may do some crazy stuff in this movie. Whereas like when you see that poster and it's a Will Ferrell movie, I think Will Ferrell is as, like as funny as anyone. But you know you're going to get a certain kind of thing. And when you don't have stars, it actually from from a comedic standpoint, like I think all of Judd Apatow's movies, you don't know what Jason Segel is going to do in a movie. I've never seen him in a movie before. He might do some crazy shit. And that's kind of the fun of those movies. They really feel subversive in that way. They feel like, I really don't know what to expect. And that, I think, in especially the kids nowadays have seen so much studio sort of dreck that there's a, unknown actors have a real opportunity right now because it's it, it really... Uh, comedy succeeds so much better when you don't you don't go into a movie with, with such, you know, with such preconceived notions of what it's going to be. Uh, that may be why people like The Ugly Truth, because the reviews were so bad that they were like, woo, this is actually can't be as bad as what they wrote about it. <laughs> Plus, no one had ever seen Gerard Butler in a comedy before. So. I think it goes... I think He's making one with Jen Anderson now, so... Yeah. I wonder... Oh, yeah. Oh, no. the critics... The critics r typically write their reviews on the way to the theater <laughs> rather than, you know... Doesn't have any reference to what they actually saw, in my experience. Uh, now I'd like to to get some questions from the audience, and yours was the first hand up. Um, I have a no, no. Mike is Mike is flying in. Right there. Right there. <laughs> Um, how different uh, was the ugly truth, the 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 the, sc the actual document from the film? Was there much change from our script? Yeah, it was exactly what we wrote. We were the we were the had the good fortune of being the last writers on the project. It was originated actually ten years ago by a writer called Nicole Eastman, and um, we it had had a long history been put into turnaround. Seven and we or were, eight writers we in between were, Nicole and yeah, we were brought in. Um, by the producers and they kept us on and so um, it was pretty faithful. I mean some scenes obviously got cut but um, it was close. It's nice. Mm -hmm. Great. And I've got a question over there. Sorry. Um, what you were talking earlier a little bit about the challenges you face with when you do comedy for female protagonists. Can you can you talk a little bit about what you've you know what you've seen in that? Well one thing that kind of drove me insane when we were making the house bunny is that I really thought it would be great to make it rated R because it's about a playboy bunny and there's lots of dirty jokes to make. But the producers in the studio were like, no, 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 we want that legally blonde audience. And I was like, mommies aren't going to take their little girls to see a movie about a playboy bunny. But they did. I mean, it was, it was rated PG-13 and little girls went, oddly, to me. But I, I mean, think it, it had a been. really good message. If you're a playboy bunny, you should become a house mother of a sorority. That's empowerment. If you're a playboy bunny, you should yeah. leave. <laughs> and did you notice that all the girls next door got the fuck out after the movie came out? I think we liberated them. I'm just <laughs> taking some credit for that. 
<laughs> We're very proud of ourselves for that. They're all gone. Great. Right back there. My question is for Scott and John. Um, one of the great things about the Hangover script was the structure because you don't know what happened that night until the very end. So they're kind of backtracking and doing all that. Was that draft one or was that draft 40? And how did you get from, because the easiest way would have been do the night, then they lose the guy, and then they try to find him. So was that the original idea or did you have to like take the whole journey to get to that? Uh, that was the original idea. We had heard um, early on that New Line wanted to do a bachelor party movie, and so we put our heads together to come up with, like, how could you do it? It seemed like an idea that had been done a bunch, and how could you do it and do it differently? I think we came up with, like, three or four different versions that we pitched to the New Line exec and to a producer, and one of them was basically dude, where's the groom? You know, it's like, they we're not going to see the party. You just wake up. They're trying to find him. And the whole time, they're just trying to, like, we like the Big Lebowski. We like Pink Panther, like, really sort of, like, detectives who are terrible at their job trying to figure out what happened. Um, and then just never see the party until sort of the very end. Um, and so that was, to answer your question, it was sort of the original concept was to not see the party. Yeah, and, and structuring it is, is a, it's a weird process because you, you find yourself in these conversations, you're like, well, the whole movie has to escalate. Everything has to get worse and worse and worse. So you start with a marriage, you marry a stripper, which is bad. Not the worst thing, but... It's happened to all of us. Yeah, we've all, come on. <laughs> it's a bad night. And then you have to build and build and build, and then you get in these conversations like, well, is a, is a tiger... Well, is a tiger worse than a baby? Like, when does the baby come in? And it's like, it's pretty surreal like to, to listen to yourself do that. But yeah, it's that's a movie that to us is like what you're saying about why it's 5% jokes. Like, that movie took so much time getting all the things in order and trying to make that all line up. It Hopefully, like, I think the goal in the, all these movies is it, it seems so obvious when it's done, but it's never obvious to us when we sit down and it takes, you know... It's a lot of trial and error. Yeah. yeah. Was the Asian gangster originally written to the script as having the smallest penis in the world? <laughs> or is that uh, Ken, just a Ken Jeong brought a whole casting. new level to that, uh, <laughs> to, that, to, that, to that performance. That was shocking. Yeah. Awesome. And yeah. Shocking. We didn't Did have, you guys, I'm sorry, go ahead. We didn't have quite as much frontal nudity in our script, <laughs> um, or male frontal, but I think from now on that will become our, our signature hallmark. <laughs> I was just going to ask if you guys, because I've read, you know, people have read reviews and written reviews about, and they, they, a lot of them referenced it's the comic memento, and have you guys even... You guys had yeah. even yeah, we, seen Memento? Did it even was there, did yeah. you have an epiphany at some point, or uh, we had seen uh, Memento is one of my favorite movies. Um, but there was, I mean, there's there's actually a lot of amnesia movies. Whether it's it's Memento or Born Identity, it's 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 a great sort of plot device to sort of drive a movie. Yeah, especially with like in instance of The Hangover, it's I don't know why we just sort of got lucky, but it's somehow funnier to see the guys reacting to what they did than actually see them doing it. Like, shooting a party is actually pretty boring. It's like, oh, this is a wild party I'm supposed to be watching, but watching the guys pull up and be like, oh my god, for whatever reason, that comedically works. And that, honestly, is luck. Like, we just sort of stumbled yeah, into we, that. We had because no. you're so involved in the audience that way, because the audience is, you know, filling in the blanks. And it's so in, relatable, too. In, I think we've all been there. Yeah. In, in hindsight, we didn't... <laughs> <laughs> In, in hindsight, we didn't know when we were doing it, but in hindsight, it, it actually sort of works like any great monster movie like Jaws. You don't show the shark, and so everybody's thinking how scary it can be or, like, you know, what, what's behind that door. Everybody is like, oh, my God, this it just must have been crazy that night. The problem with that is at the end, you do have to deliver something crazy, which sucks. Like, the first half of Hangover, it took, like, ten minutes to write, and then you're like, all right, now we have to, we've we sold all this stuff. How do we deliver, how do we possibly deliver on, and, you know, to varying degrees, they were successful. So in other ways, it still things that it's like. I think the still photos were a genius touch, though, because then you never had to see that party scene. It just it gave you enough, but it didn't explode. That was a great, you. great capper to that movie. How did you get the blowjob and under a rated R? No, so when we, first saw the, when we first saw the, uh, the screening, I, I, we, we talked to Todd after, and I was like, well, this is great, but this is clearly like just uh, just to make the execs laugh, and we're all going to get a nice release date. But clearly, we're going to have to cut. And like, no, this is already passed MPA. I honestly have no idea. It's it, incredible. I, I mean, think they, I think they left when the credits yeah. started. Yeah. Maybe. They made us cut that out of the house, Bunny. Yeah, if it's not a real penis, it's okay? Is that how it works? 
Well, there's like incredible rules, which you don't need to go over here because you guys look like nice people. But <laughs> there's there's like a whole book about w how much you can be kind of fluffed, but you got it. It's like a whole thing. No, Amy Heckling really, like told us that. Really, like a semi is okay, but a full blown owner is not. In Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Amy Heckling told us that she was allowed to show Jennifer Jason Leigh naked, but not Damone, uh, because he was erect. Because who wants to see that? The male penis <laughs> is gross. an aggressive <laughs> organ. <laughs> that's what she was told. It's an aggressive organ. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> 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 Aggressive and scary. Or Bear that in mind. Aggressive. All right. Uh, Ask one no, more. no, right behind no. you, if uh, I may. My question is about the wild card, which is Gal Fanakis' character, uh, Alan. Like, what what was your main influence behind that character? And did you see, like, did you, I mean, a lot of what Gal Fanakis did, was that, like, what you guys had in mind, or do you just feel just let Gal Fanakis just do whatever the fuck he wants? Yeah, I, I don't know if you've seen a lot of his stand-up, but he yeah. is kind of, uh, he's great. He's a great comedian, and, he's, and his comedy is very odd, and so he brought a lot of his own comedy and character work to to the movie. Yeah, like, we, I, I wish I'd written the Wolfpack speech. I, I don't, <laughs> I would never even have known how to think about the world in a way <laughs> to, to do that, but yeah, I think that's, like, I, I, I will openly say he was the least written of all the characters. Like Tiger's, uh, it's, it's cinnamon What's they the don't like or whatever? Yeah. Is that? that actually is a medical fact. Okay, but that was, was that something you guys scripted or was it just something he threw out there? Or? No. Yeah, yeah, I mean that happens. I guess following that up, um, a lot of times comedy is about creating that sort of larger than life character that we come to love, but when you're in the process, are you thinking of that character first or is it the story that comes first and the character just evolves to that point? Is that um, for anybody? I, I mean, I just can, it feels like character and premise are usually pretty tied together. Like, I mean, you come up with a great character that's, you know, going to have a wonderful journey and, you know, then you kind of want to, I, th I feel like the two are inextricably bound usually because, I mean, I don't know what what comedies there are with, like, really boring heroes, you know? Well, how funny the character came first because Anna Ferris told us she wanted to play a Playboy bunny who'd gotten kicked out of the mansion. And then her question was, where do those girls go? So we had to come up with where that girl went. So that was an instance of, like, character first and then coming up with the premise. But most of the time it's usually all at the same time, for us at least. Karen and Kirsten, uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the role of novel writing in your lives as writers uh, overall. How do you divvy up your, your time and your priorities and maybe you can also talk a little bit about the adaptation process. Well, we've each only written one novel, and we were very disappointed with the royalties, so I don't know that we'll be writing another one. <laughs> Plus, it's really hard. It's a long it's, time. it's work. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's our answer. Publishing business is a little, uh, but um, I did adapt my novel, and hopefully it'll knock on wood get made this year. Thanks to these guys, because it's the bachelorette party, so everybody's like, oh my god, it's the girl hangover. So, uh, nice. awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was kind of laying in the mud until you guys came out with that. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that, but as I adapted that, I realized how I'd kind of screwed myself over because I wanted to write a novel to get into the character's head a little bit more and the backstory and all the things you can't really do. So it was very kind of inner driven. And then when you adapt that into a script, you have to create a little bit more of a plot. So it's harder. Kirsten has not adapted hers because hers is poetry. Yeah, it's it doesn't have much of a of a plot, <laughs> <laughs> which was great. It was fun to write plot-free fiction, but then no adaptation is required. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here, guys. I'm a big fan of all of you. Um, can you talk a little bit about awarding of credit and have you uh, any of you written anything that got a tiny rewrite by someone and then they ended up sharing credit equally, or something that you felt was unfair? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh God. To start <laughs> Doesn't that happen to everybody eventually? Don't you get, I mean, have you not been boned in credit? <laughs> we haven't yet. Well, it'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> eventually. We write really good arbitration letters. Really. I think the arbitration process, I mean, there should be like a little support group that the Writers Guild should have because it is really 
it's really a, it's really an intense process, and it's its own it's its own job. I mean, it usually takes about what three four months of your life, and you have to go to all your writer friends and ask them to see their statements and understand how do we do this. And I mean, it's a whole separate. If you had thing. a degree in law, it would help. Yeah. yeah, because you really have to make a power. It's almost like you're making you're, you're Perry Perry Mason or somebody just to date myself. You you know you you have to really make a powerful argument uh, using the f you know the evidence at hand. I will uh, say on the on the flip side of that, we've done arbitrations where we thought we were like oh we're so in, and then you sit down to write the statement and you're like oh. <laughs> and the earlier writers have done a lot more than you thought. There is a process that goes on when you, when you are just like married to a script for a year, two years, three years, that you really start to believe it's yours. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then you go, you, the, the arbitration statement sort of forces you to confront the reality of like the prior scripts often. And we've definitely been in situations where we're like, oh, we're totally getting credit. Then halfway through the arbitration, we're like, all right, we're probably not. Maybe we'll get us shared. And by the end, we're like, fuck, we're not even, we don't even belong in this movie. I don't even know how we're writing this. <laughs> but it's true. It's, it's, it's a brutal process, um, and we've we've won some that I think we got lucky on. I think we've lost a couple that we don't feel good. But in retrospect, I think the ones we lost after the anger of it all subsided, I think they were probably right. Yeah, I actually I think every writer probably goes through it, and and since you you definitely feel like you have mo more ownership to it than. You do, you're not objective in, in writing your statement. Um, but in thinking about like how would the process be better, I actually really appreciate the process in the sense, like I'm not sure about the percentages and, and some, some of the rules, I think they're pretty good, but I appreciate the basic idea of the process, which is uh, you get to make your argument and then three sort of established writers, I'm not sure what the rules are, but they can't, they're not, they're people have been around for a while, have written scripts and I think got stuff made. They send it to three writers and three writers who have nothing to do with it look at all the statements and make the decision. So it seems a little, I don't know, impartial, it seems the way to do it. I think because there's no math to scripts, you can't like give it over to a computer and see like who gets credit. Um, so I do sort of like the essence of the arbitration process. I see clearly, you know, that there are whole years of my life. I think, what the f hell was I doing that year? <laughs> and, uh, oh yeah, I was rewriting that movie, but I, my name didn't wind up on it. And sometimes as a result of my not even submitting my name for our arbitration, because what I, what I was doing, uh, the, the nature of the work uh, was not fundamental enough to, to warrant a, uh, a, a co-credit on somebody's original screenplay. Uh, the rules are slightly different for an adaptation. You, you can do less and warrant a, a, a shared screenplay credit on an adaptation because both of the writers are working from source material. But on a original screenplay, the bar is higher, and I think appropriately so. Uh, but then I, then I think, well, suppose, you know, I, so, so w when I'm in that position, I think, oh God, it would be it would be great to have you know additional dialogue by Daniel Petrie Jr. Then I think, how would I feel, you know, if if I had written everything on a screenplay, but Steve Zalian came in for one day, you know, and had additional dialogue by Steve Zalian, and everybody would go, Steve Zalian? Right. Well, obviously, but he, what, yeah. he but, wrote all the good stuff. But wouldn't you still have to have that part of the arbitration? And that probably would have been true, too. Yeah. <laughs> but you would still have to have that as part of the arbitration process. It's not like they can write two lines and get a credit. You would still presumably have to have a percentage of material, um, you know. I think every actor should say after their line who wrote it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or you could do like pop-up video they used to do where just go boop and say written by John Lucas and <laughs> yeah. or All right. bubble. You have a yeah. question over there? Thanks guys. Um, as far as when you've written a couple of scripts and you're wanting to get it out there, I mean, do you recommend trying to just get an agent first or do you recommend sending it to specific production companies that are geared to the, toward that kind of film or everything and anything or don't, but whatever you do, do. Anyone? <laughs> I did all of the above. I sent it to production companies and agents either. and managers and whoever would read it. I think 
contests are, are pretty a pretty great way to put yourself out into the marketplace because I think a lot of agencies rely on contests to be a barometer of talent. So there's a lot of you know, there's Austin Film Festival, and I think you could pretty much research like the top 10 screenwriting contests and even little ones, and then you suddenly you have an award winning script, maybe, and then that puts you a little ahead of the curve. So, you had yeah. mentioned. And, so. and producers and studio executives do sort of troll the screenplay competitions looking for scripts, um, and so it's actually a great way to sort of get your material out there and people spotting it. Great. I was a judge at Austin one year, and the guy that I picked to win got signed by William Morris right away and has sold, gotten a couple assignments and he's working. And literally, like, the other judge aside from me was so hungover, he's like, I don't give a shit, just pick, just pick. <laughs> so it was just like, and I love this guy's script. It was called Jerusalem. It was like the English patient, but really good. And, uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> I swear to God, I totally did not know anything about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict before that, but by the end of the script, I was weeping and I so got it. Yeah. And then, like, so I was so excited for this guy to win and I was expecting, like, this old rabbi to stand up and get the award. It was like this white Lutheran guy from Boulder, Colorado, and he was, so he's been out here. Did they, have they made it? it it's not it called. Never got don't made. I don't know why. It, it's so it's, good. I thought it was called "Don't Mess with the Zohan." Yeah. No? <laughs> that was not it. Thank you. It's really good. That's a good answer, by the way, because you know what? Before the internet. It would have been much, much more difficult to do what they've just suggested, and 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 people used to ask me, you know, ten years ago, what should I do? And the internet wasn't quite at everyone's fingertips. And I'd say, so many production companies will not take just anybody's script. You got to have an if it doesn't come with a cover on it from an agency, they won't even read. But now she's exactly, they're exactly right. It's you should you should you sign a just, just a send buckshot it. approach, just send it in every direction. And don't copyright your script. Why is that? Because I think that I've heard, well, I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but I think you should register it at the Writers Guild, but that like copyright thing is a, it's like a, it's a sign of the devil. Dork or don't, something. Yeah, don't, you can copyright it, just don't, you can copyright it, just don't put it on, on the title the, page, because yeah. then people realize you're not sort of like, uh, cool. you don't, you're, yeah, yeah you're, you're not cool. You'll yeah. Uh, I just want to say that the library downstairs has a list of all the uh, top contests, so oh, that's great. a really quick way of, um, you don't even have to research it, just go to the library and get the list. All right, all right back here, way in the back. Um, this may sound a little silly, but I'm wondering, do you need to be funny to write comedy? And how much do you, how much do you have to make people laugh in the pitch to get the gig? If they don't laugh in the pitch, they're not going to buy it. Uh, Kirsten is the best laugher in the world. Like when we're pitching, she will laugh at every joke I tell as if she's heard it for the first time. <laughs> she's your and chill. she's brilliant at that. And so I'm, bring me, yeah, and bring I'll make Kirsten. you sound funny, even yeah. if you're not. That's the secret. Uh, I will say, it, ha Scott and I have a weird pitching style that, for whatever reason, people seem to respond to. But it it helps having. I, I'd love to hear actually how you pitch, because I pitched once on my own, and it was like, <laughs> and then you just turn the page, like, and then, and it's so hard to hit jokes when you're doing it on your own. Uh, for me, anyway, and having Scott there, we we sort of laugh sometimes, especially if it's a co like an ice cold room. Those awful, awful, awful like 19 dudes in suits around the table, and they're like. Be funny and you're like oh god this is gonna be like but it's nice because then you start trying to like I'll start just trying to throw stuff at him that'll hopefully make him like you know I'll change stuff because you know you, you always know I'm sure you, you always know when it, you're dead I mean like you just I you do don't a know. lot of funny dances for her like I'm like Ooh, you know I do funny things I'm Accents. like I become a clown I just become a ridiculous person but yeah. anyway how do you do yeah, it? Is more like stand -up? Well that's that's where my yeah my 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 experience of doing stand-up definitely pay, uh, has paid off in the past, uh, you know. You know uh, because uh, I, I will, I will, I have to go in knowing I'm going to tell the story. But I definitely have two or three things that I know will make them laugh. You sprinkle it in there, um, and I would suggest, you know, doing stand up is very for most people. They'd, they'd rather, you know, perform their pull their own tooth out with the pliers. But um, but you can one thing you can do, which could get you comfortable uh, being, you know, trying to, you know, working on your sense of humor in front of an audience, you could try to do an improv thing or join an improv group. A lot of comedy writers have, have come up that way. Uh, 
especially the SNL people like Tina Fey and people like that. So, and I don't know how hard it is to get into those, but you know, uh, that that would be something that would be, uh, I think, very valuable. Um, also, you make connections. You get you you would meet somebody who maybe shares your sense of humor, and then you can start uh, writing sketches for your class, and then sketches. Uh, I told you about the UCLA Comedy Club back in 1982, uh, maybe. Chris Matheson and Ed Solomon came up on stage and just started riffing, going, we're the Wild Stallions, I'm Bill, and I'm Ted. And they just started doing it, and then they, three months later, had a script, and then a year and a half later, had a movie. So there you go. They were just, but, it was yeah. born out of a sketch. But the best part about writing, though, if you don't feel like you're going to be at your best in a pitch is you can just write it. I mean, that's the great joy. If You know, you could there I would actually argue that most, I don't know about you guys, like whenever I meet a comedic actor, they're always, I would put them like, 10 to 30 times funnier than I am. Like, they have an ability, you know, working with like Vince Vaughn or guys like that. You, you go into a room and they're just like, it's rapid fire. It's like it is in the movies. It, you know, it's, it, they're that funny and they just have a gift for that. And if that's not your strength, then I, you know, the great thing is that you, you, can, you can always sort of write funny. I think writers tend to be not the guys you usually first notice in a room who are like trying to kill, with, you know, like ordering lunch funny. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I think like, yeah, yeah. And I think there's, there's something to that. Like that. Yeah, you really have to think about what your personality and your strengths are. I mean, you know, I, I know that I can pitch better than maybe the average guy because I've had more experience doing it. But what he's saying is if, essentially if you don't feel strong about pitching and you're not the kind of person that can walk into a room and, and draw attention and get laughs easily, then don't put yourself in positions necessarily where you're pitching a lot because it's going to, you know, it's going to ultimately uh, be disappointing perhaps. Yeah, there probably are worse things than pitching a horrible comedy pitch in life, but for me it's it's got to be up there as like, it's it, the Cold. It's cold. It's cold when it's cold. <laughs> trying. I, I'm trying to transition from writing uh, on my own and writing with a partner, and and we're both sort of like, how how do we? Yeah, we're both solo writers. Try trying to figure that out and and maybe you guys could give us some tips. It's some a, a, a writing partnership is a lot like a marriage and so you sort of need to treat it like that. You uh, you sort of date, you do, you write beautiful bits together and then like, <laughs> um, but like literally, so I've known John for 10 years and, and you know you'll spend whatever like 10 hours with him during the day and I'll spend you know 10 hours are you like serious every day yes, every day oh my god <laughs> when, when we first started writing we would treat it like a job we start we start at 9 and we'd wrap up at 7 and so you'd be sort of together all day and then you spend a couple hours with your wife at night so so it was actually a more sort of intense relationship in some levels um, and uh, <laughs> but he's very but, tender. But in <laughs> but in all sometimes you have to go to couples therapy, which is what we did. Did point. you really? Yeah, we did. Which one of you would be the wife? You think, <laughs> if the two of you? <laughs> Just curious. Yeah, who's that's the like pitcher? A, who's the catcher? That's like a Wait, gender bias question. I want to hear. I want to hear, hear about therapy. Do you guys really want to? You guys, who, who decided? Because you guys were at each other's throats or something? Uh, wow. No, we were just, I mean, we, we've been writing together for so long, and like we Get each it. have I, our I own I understand. I'm just like, he he I mean, wants like, to know the I'm number always, of your therapist. I'm often... <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Which Palumbo therapist? In, uh, where was he? In Encino? It's Sherman a write-off, so... Encino. And he used to be a screenwriter, so he can actually give you notes if you're like working on a pitch. But like I'll get bored with talking about your couple stuff. You're just like, so we're working on this pitch, and then he'll like give you notes. It's awesome. He fixed like a major second act problem in one of our things. Oh, yeah, he's great. <laughs> Dr. Palumbo, uh, I highly recommend him. I don't want to I don't want to take Dan's job as a moderator, but I'm curious something occurred to me a while ago. I'm wild to yeah. Oh, no, I'm just curious cuz do, do you think there has to be a yin and a yang if you if you, if, if uh, with a writing partner if you're too much alike then it won't work like somebody cuz I've noticed that a lot of successful comedy teams there tends to be somebody who's maybe more free thinking and pacing and throwing out the ideas and there's somebody who's kind of grounding them and structuring more and going Okay, calm down. That's a good idea. That's nuts. And kind of, do, you, do you find yourselves falling into a that, pattern like that? That absolutely works for us. I think uh, John is much stronger at sort of character and dialogue and writing, and I'm stronger at proofreading. And so that balances out really nice. 
Um, <laughs> but but that, and that's funny, but it's, but it's true. You have, if you have two guys who are crazy, they'll crack up for 10 hours straight, and then they'll go, oh, shit, did anybody write that down? But, uh, but so, actually, actually I, I wish we had like a stenographer, because we're like, oh my god, that was brilliant, but none of us wrote it down. Fuck. So you maybe you two are a little, both a little too on the same side of things, you think, as opposed I mean, to these guys? usually has the pad. She's more of a pacer. I'm more of a floater. I float in the pool, and I'm like, okay, what about this and this and this? So then she's writing as I'm floating. But then while she's pacing, then I'm writing. So we switch up. So you tag team. So your, your strengths are maybe perhaps almost equal, equal well, in that no, sense, but you take when turns. When we started, I think Karen's strength was, was dialogue, and, and I had more of a structure background because I'd been you know working Deep in role. development and reading tons of scripts. But it's the beauty of a long relationship like this is we've kind of taught each other. And so we're, we're closer to being equal now. But when we started and, you know, we did, we brought different things to the table so hopefully that's true with you guys and and so John is better at character and and dialogue and I when I was first writing I was doing plot driven stuff so I'm perhaps a little more plot and and story um, and you are right like like in a in a marriage it also helps you know my wife's in charge of everything and I do whatever she says so there's a nice balance there um, <laughs> but but actually I think it uh, realistically, I think where it helps is, and, and this actually works for a marriage and a writing partnership, it, it helps if you argue really well, that you can, you have a problem and you can each fight your argument and get to a resolution and not take it personally. And if people have different strengths, then, you know, if we're arguing over dialogue, I'll be like, okay, John, you know, you, you, I'll go, with, I'll trust you that that's a better joke. Um, and like in a marriage, if, you know, you're arguing over whatever, something that your wife is stronger in, you'll sort of like give that up. So I think learning how to argue with a partner is a, a really good thing to do. And then it is like a marriage if you're always arguing, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, how many sessions of therapy did, did this, did this like take? Ten times. There was a couple times where she forgot and didn't show up, and I'd be like, oh. That's <laughs> oh. Oh. Were you in the waiting room and people were checking you out like, uh, you know, hey, don't worry, we, we're Prop 8, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they thought you were a gay couple or something? Or? No, he specializes, he specializes in writers. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. The uh, question is, when you're handed an assignment and they say the studio only wants character work, what does that mean? This is for the panel. Usually, in our case, it means that the girl character isn't strong enough, <laughs> and they want us to make her cooler and smarter. Um, that's usually exactly yes. what it means. For me, it means they're about to fire me. <laughs> <laughs> I think character work often means cast. That's usually how I hear the note. Like, we need, we're trying to get, we've underwritten a part frankly usually a woman and we're trying to get a star who is fully aware that she's no role in this movie so can you beef her up it's not always i'm being a little glib but like often it's like a secondary or tertiary character that isn't fully developed and they're, they're realizing now that there's no way an actress will play this role or an actor will play this role so you need to like give them that one scene where they get to cry frankly it, usually and then you know it's like oh they threw character in and that's in women are women are simple like that no not <laughs> they just no. want to cry no actually i was actually thinking of men but like in terms of like in terms of actors like there's like like literally you'll go into meetings and it's like give him like to let him cry twice, and then you're like, okay, now he's got a he's got an arc, and you're like, all right, that's awesome. Um, I think that I think that's also code for uh, when they say more character work. I think sometimes that's code for more clarity of character. I mean, like they're just yeah, well, they're just not quite arc. getting who that person is, what their goal is, what you know, what their role is. They just want more. You know, they want it more clearly defined. Um, so then you go and say, all right, then you have to actually think, okay, well, what? How am I shortchanging? this person and you have to literally write more of that in ways that doesn't don't seem obvious do you ever get asked to put in ubiquitous or unnecessary set pieces by the studio executives oh, oh yeah every now yes and yeah and how do you deal with it hey we need a set piece right here come up with one and you're like okay maybe the nail salon gets robbed yeah. <laughs> we spent like two weeks trying to come up with a set piece for legally blonde that involved just many many bad ideas and then it ended up being the bend and snap thing which then got turned into a musical number which was not our original intent but people <laughs> like it so uh, yeah it, but that came out of write a set piece for the nail salon I, I think you definitely do get a lot of bad notes from studios um, but 
but something that I, I think John and I have taken to heart, we got this advice uh, a while back from this this uh, really smart man, Dan Petrie Jr., who, um, who said, uh, when you get a bad note, say, it's a, it's a really stupid note, say, okay, well, what if this was a good note? <laughs> and what, what would it be? And Wait, do you say that to exec or to yourself? No, we don't say it out loud. Okay. <laughs> Wow, this is a whole new world. Um, but it does make some sense because the executives, it takes a, a little bit of work to get to where they are. They're usually fairly intelligent and they are trying to make a good movie. They're not trying to destroy your movie. And so, so as, as hard as that uh, is sometimes to perceive. Right. And so you have to take a step back and go, okay, what, what are they reacting to? If they want, they want an, a set piece here, maybe what they're really saying is the script is dragging in this point. And so how would we address that? Are they right? Yes, it is dragging. So how would we fix it? that um, and it helps you not to get so pissed off at them but 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 I, but I think that's good advice to to what what is the real underlying problem they're having with the script yeah the, our manager always says that too what's the note behind the note yeah. although if you're in production and you've got a director and a big piece of talent sometimes you will get these requests for set pieces based on a whim you know like the, the actor says I've always wanted to fill in the blank I've always wanted to you know do a scene in where I'm where I'm a sushi chef so figure out how I run into the restaurant and I hide behind the counter and then I put a thing on ice. Whatever it is, you do get those occasionally and it's just you just have to make it work because at that point you're pregnant in pre-production and you've got a big star who you have to cater to. So it does happen. Yeah, like the last minute set piece I don't find particularly hard, but the wor the worst moments I think come from and actually we met working on uh, Monster in Law, I recall. And uh, th the worst moment is like you're in production, they're like everyone's on set and it's like okay we have this scene we need you to do. We have to learn that her dad died that she misses the dad, that she likes art, and she's always hidden her art book, and she's <laughs> maybe one of the greatest artists in the world. Also, it's a love scene, so there's a guy who's coming in who she's never met before, and then, and like, I'm not really kidding, there is that scene in the movie, which you were probably, if you saw in the theater, you're kind of like, what is, the, what is going on in this scene? This makes no sense, and that's, that's actually when, you know, that's actually the real challenge, and that's a whole different skill, too. We are talking about, like, frankly, as, it's as different from screenwriting as writing a novel. It's like when you're given the five minutes to write the scene, then it's like that's a whole other talent to have, um, which I don't, I, I think we clearly proved we didn't have <laughs> in that scene. But it's like doing comedic Sudoku. You have to, like, you just have to find the right plug-in and... The first and make it flow. Yeah. But the first round of punch up on that was so awesome because they kept changing her job. So we'd write a scene and they're like, no, now she's a dog walker. Right. Now she's a temp. And we're like, we're getting paid she's by the day. Maker. Make her whatever you want. Like, she's, yeah, she's, a, back. she's a dog walker who lives on the beach in Venice. Right. And I was I like, know. I want to walk those dogs. Exactly. It's a very lucrative job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to this side of the room. If there's any questions. No, I don't see any. Who's... Right back there. I just have a question about management versus agents. And, and I guess some of you have managers and some of you have agents. Do you find managers helpful? Do you uh, not? Uh, what's, what's, your, what's your take? We're lucky because we have a really amazing manager. But I don't, I don't. I don't know if they make a lot like him. I mean, he, he, we've been with him. He sold 10 Things I Hate About You. He's an incredibly smart brainstormer. He's really good with structure. He's really um, emotionally and politically quite a savvy fellow. You know, he's talked us off many ledges. I, he, I mean, I, the man is sort of Superman, so I, I don't know. But if all managers are like that. But I think it's great to have any num as many people in your corner as you can possibly summon up. Um, and if they love your work and are passionate about you, it doesn't really matter what their exact job title is. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. John and I don't, we've never had a manager, but uh, when you're starting out, uh, anybody you can get to champion your material is great. If you've got, you know, you've got a uh, manager, an agent, an attorney, a producer, and you're giving away 90% of what you make, at least you have people getting your material out there, at least you're making something. Um, so I, I, would, I would second that. All right. So one of my favorite screenwriting books is Save the Cat, which does an excellent job of breaking down Legally Blonde, actually. But um, it's very specific about saying, you know, the catalyst should be definitely on page 12 or the act break should definitely be on page 25. Do you guys religiously adhere to these or do you not care if it doesn't necessarily fit? And I'm, this is a question for everybody, not just... I've never read a screenwriting book 
I just never have. I don't know about you guys. I mean, but you can't like be so beholden to page twelve. If it's twelve to sixteen, or you know, it's. I mean, we used to write really long first acts, and they would inevitably get cut in the cutting room. Like Legally Bond's first act, there was probably like five ten minutes cut out of it at, in the movie. So now we write much shorter first acts because we just know it's going to get cut anyway. So it's actually made us sound. But we do that because of experience of our stuff getting cut, not because we read in a book to end our first act on page 12. Although I will say you do this really good thing where like if we finish a script sometimes, I mean it doesn't, you don't do this all the time, but like you read Save the Cat like after we finished yeah. the script and then you know kind of applied the rules in like, the rewrite process because we, we were sort of struggling of a little bit. So or something. Yeah, because yeah. like, they break it down into the, like those little moments. I'll be like, oh, that's what we're missing. This, That's why this lags right here. We don't have the, he smells a fart moment. You, whatever they call them. There's all like little moments that I can't remember. I mean, sometimes it's good also to like w watch movies and break down the, the, the movies structurally if you're if you're stuck in the script and if you have a model for a film that you love and you know there's lots of tricks in terms of getting yourself inspired it seems like so much of the stuff coming out of Hollywood these days are either adaptations of other works or toys or whatever but it seems like comedy is like the one genre that a lot of this almost everything is original but does is is your work reflecting of that is, is most of the stuff you do original or do you do adaptations too or are just adaptations not funny <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, sort of the comedic novel is sort of a rarity like like the, the comedic novel where you read it and you're laughing aloud all the time there's definitely very like great like wry novels and you know thank you for smoking and like great movie great novel um, but I think like the laugh out loud comedy is hard to find in a novel you don't find like comic books that they're adapting into like hilarious comic books um, so I, I Blonde was based on a novel, by the way. What's just that? as it, yeah. All right, well. Uh, this is this is a question for Kirsten and Karen. Um, thank you so much for your work. I think you're involved in you know in shaping a, a cinema for women, which has been such a need personally for me and for the world, I think. And I, I the question that I would like to ask you, although there are seven thousand of them, is um, do you see films about women, by and about women as protagonists, do you see them as similar to or different from essentially the films about men and in each way, like in some ways different, in some ways the same, but how do you, how do you visualize that difference as you're involved in sort of creating it? I don't really think I've visualized the difference. I mean, like, if you think of Liar Liar, that could have easily been a woman in that role. So, I mean, I think there are certain things that, tra there are certain stories that can only be, like, House Bunny wouldn't really have worked with a dude. So, but I mean, most stories are <laughs> comedically. Because guys get kicked out of the mansion constantly. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, we, we try to think of, stories that would work for either sex just to make it more universal but like I said some stories are strictly female driven. Thanks so much for saying that by the way. That's very sweet. Um, yeah I mean we we are women so it's like we we kind of want to watch movies about women and we sort of want to write stories that are uh, about ladies like us you know so I think that that's just a big part of it and try not to overthink it too much and just try to write a character that we really are amused by and uh, understand their dilemmas and just like just like these guys would probably. Is there a question that that you want to answer that wasn't asked <laughs> anybody uh, that would be like the like when when uh, when I started uh, to uh, I was about to direct for the first time I asked my dad who was a director for the single best piece of advice that he could give the young writer starting uh, as as a as a director and he said Danny get a flu shot so do you have in in that vein uh, do you have a single great piece of advice to give to to writers who are setting out to 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 write to write comedy perhaps I, I don't have a great piece of advice but I have a piece of advice um, something uh, Jim said earlier about having to do like five jokes every night like w when you were working back in, in the day and that 
sort of uh, taught you how to generate material, like sort of that deadline. I think if you're starting out writing, really like like write. Don't don't be the guys like oh I didn't, my muse hasn't hit me. I'm not going to write today. It's like every day write. Um, you know, I, when, when I was first starting out, it's like I, I was like, I'm going to write a page a day, just one page. And it's really easy because, like, you just put a lot of dialogue. You're stupid. No, you're stupid. You're stupid. And, but, and then you're done, you know? <laughs> but, like, what, so one page is pretty easy. But then at the end of three months, you have 90 pages, and it feels like a script. John, do you have anything to... I'm not sure so much advice, just maybe like a, a hopeful thought. Uh, I, I sincerely believe that getting into the film industry, I, I don't know that I would have any clue how to do it as an actor or a director or any of those uh, other routes, but I do sincerely believe that if you're a writer, it does not matter who you are, where you're from, what you look like. If you have a great script, people will want it. And great doesn't necessarily mean great in the classic sense, I mean a great commercial, a viable commercial movie. I sincerely believe that anyone can get in. And I think like Scott and I are working on some original stuff and we're still thinking like we did 12 years ago when we hadn't sold a spec before. It's the same process. It's trying to find big uh, commercial ideas that we can sell. And that way I feel like it's not exactly a meritocracy, but it's as close as Hollywood comes to it. And I think uh, I think that's that always will give me hope because like the the truth is Scott and my career will you know we're gonna spiral into drugs and do all the like we like we like <laughs> I'll, I'll like do like we'll move to Florida I'll get the jet skis I'll do the whole like vanilla ice like meltdown thing and then we'll want the comeback tour and the truth is I I sincerely believe that like it, it, down the line if if we still have a great idea it doesn't really matter where we've been or what we've done that Hollywood is so hungry for a great spec that I, everyone everyone has a shot of getting in. Just don't put the copyright thing on the title page. Yeah. <laughs> Karen? Do you that have gives it? me so much hope. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like the Obama up here. I feel like, you know what I mean? That's good. I'm dropping up um, I guess my advice would be just like get rid of fear. Because I remember when I was, you know, in Denver just writing script after script, I, I kind of hit a wall at one point and I didn't want to finish the script because I thought it was a really great idea. But like halfway through, I was just like, ah, oh, what if it doesn't? What if it's not? What if it sucks and it doesn't sell? But then I realized, but I haven't sold anything already, so <laughs> what I'm afraid of is what I have now. Anyways. So I might as well just fucking finish it, right? Because there was like no point in just, yeah. So then once I figured that out, I was like, oh, do, 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 went back. So just get rid of all the little <laughs> things you talk yourself into. Kristen, you have the last uh, This word is all really good. I don't want to be the end because I don't know if it's. Um, <laughs> I think. Uh, you, you don't know, feel don't, on the spot. Well, at all. a little so. bit I do, yeah. yeah. But um, I will say that you know, just don't don't take rejection personally and um, take it as a challenge you know and just keep going and write another script and um, be all you can be and just dream big and you can do it and um, yeah okay